mitral regurgitation, but also learn a little bit about various methods to coordinate uh, mitral regurgitation. Just to keep the uh, presentation interesting, uh, uh, I made it uh, uh, sort of a little bit of audience response. So Friday at 4.45, your colleague calls because his friend is visiting him from out of town. He wants you to see the patient. Uh, she's 44 with a murmur. You said, no problem. Uh, I leave at five, but I can take care of this quickly. So the patient is a 44-year-old woman with a known murmur at age 17. She got one episode of lightheadedness after exercise and she had to stop. And you examine, um, and then you also get an echocardiogram. This is what you see from the echocardiogram, this Bershon view. You can see the mitral valve is abnormal. You turn on the color, there is mitral regurgitation. So we'll use, instead of audience response, we'll just use show of hands for the next question. Uh, how many think this is endocarditis is show of hands? How many think this is related to myocardial infarction and that's why the valve is leaking? How many think this is mitral valve prolapse? How many think this is a rheumatic valve disease? Looks like you have gotten the question correctly and I'm done, I'm just kidding. Uh, so this is a even more difficult perhaps, um, so this is the mitral regurgitation you're looking at, uh, how many think uh, it's grade one mild? How many think it's grade two mild to moderate? Few. How many think it's grade three moderate to severe? And how many think it's grade four? Okay. And obviously all these answers will have absolutely incredible implications of what we want to do about the tissue. So I want to give you the answer, so uh, at least to keep things interesting. How much is the MR? So traditionally, we have relied on color flow imaging, um, but it has uh, lots and lots of pitfalls. This mostly involves looking at the color jet area in the left atrium and proportion to the left atrial area. So there are quantitative and we must move more towards quantitative techniques rather than relying on the color flow estimation of uh, mitral regurgitation and iodic regurgitation. Vena contracta is uh, one such principle where the regurgitated orifice when the jet accelerates towards that, there are proximal flow convergence region and narrow portion of that jet is called vena contractor. And the vena contractor width, so if you look at the proximal flow convergence, narrow portion of the jet is called vena contractor and then uh, the jet uh, sprays out. The vena contractor width has been correlated with the quantitative Doppler, in fact, by my colleague uh, in Rochester, Dr. Serrano, and uh, his fellow, uh, if it is more than 0.7 centimeters, is considered severe, mild is less than 0.3. You could also do quantitative Doppler, so you can look at the LPOT diameter, and if there is not much aortic regurgitation and only mitral regurgitation, you, know, you can look at the valve area, sorry, uh, LVOT area. If you multiply by the TVI, you get the stroke volume through the LVOT. And you can look at the mitral annulus and if you can get the diameter and if you multiply by the TBI through the mitral annulus, so this is at the annular level, you can get the stroke volume through the mitral valve. If you take the difference, you get the amount of mitral regurgitation. Of course, one needs to be very careful measuring the diameter of the LVOT and also the mitral annulus because even if you make minor uh, errors, it can amplify because you're squaring the diameters. And so what about the third method? It's called proximal isovelocity surface area. So I talked a little bit about the flow accelerating uh, towards the regenerative orifice. So if you shift the baseline, you see these flow convergence zones. So essentially you're applying continuity method at the level of the valve. So this is the regenerative orifice. So you can see the flow convergence here. It looks like a hemisphere. So you can take advantage of that and use continuity method. So you can say flow rate from one side is equal to the flow rate the other side. If you have a hemisphere is two pi r squared times velocity will give you the flow rate on one side. The unknown quantity, the effective regurgitant orifice area, the area through which regurgitation takes place. And if you have amount of regurgitant velocity, if you uh, rearrange the equation, you can get the ERO. And you can also get the regurgitant volume by multiplying by T, TBI. So how is the, this done in real life? So this is somebody with severe prolapse, possibly a ruptured cord we cannot see, but nevertheless, you can see the color flow jet in the left atrium. As we said, if you just rely on the color flow, you may not see much occupying in the left 
atrium, but you can actually see the uh, nice flow convergence zone once you shift the baseline towards the jet. So in this case, the LAC velocity is 72, radius is 1.05, you can calculate the surface area, and then uh, if you have the TBI of the MR regurgitant jet and the velocity, you can calculate the regurgitant volume. And so what is severe? Grade 4 more than 60 ml and the RO is more than 0.4 centimeters square or 40 millimeters square, less than 10 is mild and the RO is less than 20 millimeters square. Who cares? You know, why do you need to even quantitate? Why can't you just use a, a sort of a, a rough estimate? Because this is published in New England Journal, again my mentor and colleague Dr. Sorano in Rochester. And he showed the survival or the prognosis depends on the quantitative ERO. So it has a tremendous implications on the prognosis, especially if it is more than 0.4, they have worse prognosis with time. And more importantly, nowadays with the transcatheter therapies, uh, they won't qualify unless you can actually quantitate and say a patient truly has severe mitral regurgitation. So this is the criteria from the COAP trial that showing effective regurgitation in the office area of more, more than 0.3 majority of patients had this to even qualify or you can use a combination of regurgitant volume and uh, ERO if it didn't meet that criteria and minor percentage with other criteria. So now armed with all this, uh, what do we think this is? Mild or moderate or moderately severe or severe, uh, but let me just kind of show you the calculations and the next slide. So you shifted the baseline and you got the TBI of the MR 152, ERO is 0.3, regurgitant volume is 40. So you think this may be actually uh, moderately severe grade 3, but the issue is this is mid to late systole. So this is a mitral prolapse, so the regurgitation doesn't happen throughout systole. So you have to take the TBI of whenever the regurgitation happens. So in this case, the regurgitant volume is 20, ERO will overestimate that. So in this case, the regurgitation happens mid to late systole, you can see in the color M mode, and so therefore this patient only has mild mitral regurgitation. And normal LV size, remember if it is a chronic MR, unlikely this is severe MR with normal LV size. And you can also use 3D being a contractor area if you have a nice uh, 3D data set, uh, especially people with ischemic MRs, they have elliptical orifice, and this would be another method. Uh, if all LV, else fails, you can use MRI continuity method there using phase contrast um, uh, uh, velocity encoding and then you can figure out what the regurgitant volume is as a gold standard. So there are specific criteria, this is by the ASC guidelines of what constitutes severe MR, uh, but if, though, if the patient does not meet the criteria, you need to quantitate and do further, otherwise do TE or MRI if in doubt. Mechanism of MR, in this case, uh, we already saw this is mitral valve prolapse. This is primary, which basically means something wrong with the valve. And this is also another primary MR where there's a severe prolapse. In this case, you can actually see P2 segment that's prolapsing, resulting in severe mitral regurgitation. And now with the advent of 3D, you can actually see the P2 segment prolapsing towards you. This is anterior, this is posterior. And this is another case of actually uh, ruptured cord with a severe mitral regurgitation. Because of the ruptured cord, you can actually see the flow convergence zone here. And in 3D, you can see the uh, lateral part of P2 with the flail uh, cord. And uh, turning on the collar, you can see the uh, severe regurgitation. Uh, in this patient, uh, initially it appears maybe prolapse or something like that, but this patient had uh, actually um, uh, old endocarditis is an A-line pilot, no symptoms, but uh, he walks uh, and no problem, but has a significant mitral regurgitation murmur and turned out that he has a perforation in the anterior lateral commissure that resulting in severe mitral regurgitation. So the treatment would be different than patients with the mitral valve prolapse where the valve could be repaired. So this is another reason why the valve can leak because the calcium can extend into the uh, valve leaflets. The LV function is normal. Here you can actually see the circumferential calcification that's interfering with the leaflet motion and resulting in severe mitral regurgitation. So this is somebody with the mitral annular calcification going into the uh, mitral valve leaflets itself resulting in severe mitral regurgitation. So this is somebody else with a uh, valve problem as well, primary mitral regurgitation because of the cleft-like uh, uh, cleft indentation and you need to make sure it's leaking through the cleft to say this is significant cleft. 
So this is another view of the same patient actually showing where the regurgitation is happening through the cleft. And so we talked about primary MR from a perforation or mitral prolapse or uh, calcification, even rheumatic valve disease could do that or drug induced. What are the other reasons for the mitral valve leak? So it's a secondary cause. So the LV is the problem, not the valve. So if the papillary muscles get distorted because of dilated cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy such as this, where you can see in the lateral wall is akinetic, LV is dilated, they can have posterior directed mitral regurgitation because the posterior leaf is getting cold. It's not mitral valve prolapse. So another case of uh, uh, severe uh, tethering of the leaflets because of LV dysfunction, regional wall motion abnormalities uh, resulting in severe mitral regurgitation in this case. And so um, let's uh, let's look at uh, uh, this case also. Same thing with the regional wall motion abnormality and the inferior uh, portion of the LV with the prior MI. Uh, resulting in non coaptation and also severe mitral regurgitation. Sometimes you need to put the 3D like this, not on pause, because you don't know the, if the tethering is occurring and where it's occurring, but you can see the posterior portion of the leaflet is getting tethered or restricted, and so that's uh, how the mitral regurgitation is happening. Nowadays, we're also recognizing something called atriogenic mitral regurgitation, where the uh, leaflets don't occupy the whole annulus which is dilated that results in atriogenic mitral regurgitation. So these are all examples of secondary mitral regurgitation, ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or atrial mitral regurgitation. And so these are se several etiologies of mitral regurgitation. So echo plays a great role uh, looking at is it primary or secondary or how much is the mitral regurgitation, but we use quantitative uh, approach as much as possible, we use ancillary science. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir, for your nice presentation and there are very good cases. Now I call upon uh, the second speaker, Shantanu Shengupta. Uh, he, he will uh, talk about the concomitant HOCM and aortic stenosis diagnosis and management.